you, Anita, and a very warm welcome from everyone. Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you, Uta, for this beautiful introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was really a very good opportunity to collect some thoughts together, to bring them together, to reflect more. And I'm also super happy that many of my, my collaborators and friends are in this meeting because uh, without them, actually, all of this would not be possible. And it, it is in this exchange with Nada, with Yulia, or together working in uh, art organizations like with Haika, in Ike, and so on, that all of this um, is kind of uh, becomes like a ground for thought and uh, all these exchanges can kind of contribute. So uh, I, I'm uh, not such a big uh, defender of individual authorship, actually. So I think the whole community around the institution and all people that with their wisdom and experience uh, that they share with me, I think this is all like uh, also thanks to them that we are developing a lot of things uh, together. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I will be uh, sharing uh, uh, some links in the chat windows during my talk because I, I collected uh, more information in case someone would be interested in following this. So you can later save save the chat uh, on your computer if you want. Uh, there is like a button of that. I'm not sure you know it. Um, and of course, if you have any comments or you can directly also write in the chat window also during my talk, you know, it's a, uh, I, I remember in our permaculture course at Temporary Gallery uh, that uh, uh, also Nada was involved and moderated. We had a very lively uh, chat windows uh, and uh, it's so many great uh, guests uh, tonight, I think this, we can also have it. <laughs> uh, so so uh, don't hesitate to do it. Uh, I will, uh, uh, my talk has several parts uh, uh, and uh, I hope I, I will not talk too long because it was really uh, like a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas came to my mind. So I try, I will try to be precise and maybe not, um, uh, and sometimes maybe I don't have to uh, dedicate so much time to certain topics. Um, um, I would like to start with a kind of observation that I guess many of you also have that in the last years there was this a kind of a proliferation of uh, uh, art exhibitions and projects dedicated to plants, ecology. Um, and of course, there are many reasons for that. Uh, 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 there were there was, for example, this very famous exhibition Animism at Haus der Kultur and der Welt, then critical zones, observatories for earthly politics at ZKM in Karlsruhe a nice exhibition that, that many of them also have online versions. Uh, the, the Botanical Mind, Art, Mysticism and the Cosmic Tree at uh, Camden Arts Center in London has a quite, uh, quite nice uh, online version. Of course, uh, Manifesta 12 in Palermo. Uh, there was also a quite uh, nice show at Mumok in Vienna, uh, Naturgeschichten Spuren des Politischen. Uh, so uh, uh, we can we can see a kind of a trend, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the, and this exhibition very often are based on quite good research. And of course, there are many, but this that that I'm that I now mentioned, I think they were quite uh, the research was quite substantial, and the result was also super interesting. I collected uh, some links uh, in case someone would like later. Uh, to uh, follow follow that, and I will I will share it in the in the chat window. Uh, of course, there were also like big shows of singular artists, uh, like for example uh, Pierre Hick at Museum Ludwig and uh, Sandro Pompidou uh, an exhibition that was, for example, for me personally quite important. Uh, uh, and I also did I also curated several exhibitions that are dedicated to this topic, like what uh, Uta uh, just mentioned. Uh, one of them was uh, at Academy de Cluster de Welt, Florafilia Revolution of Plants. Uh, I'm sorry, Florafilia Plants as Archives. Uh, and um, uh, I can actually show uh, some photos from this exhibition. I will not talk uh, extensively about it, uh, but I will share a link that uh, uh, you, will, you will be actually in this link that I provided. Uh, there is a link, it's a, it's a second exhibition, Florafidia Revolution of Plants, but 
there is a link there and if you follow it you will find more infos also about chlorophyllia plants as archives okay now i can so in case you haven't seen this one uh, this is what uta was just describing and it was a uh, very much uh, related to what academy is doing this kind of exploration of colonial uh, heritage and how uh, uh, how this um, goes along with uh, uh, trading certain plants and uh, uh, and the different types of uh, uh, different different types of plant movements as well between between continents um, and this show was accompanied by a symposium, um, Botanical Garden as a Colonial Site, uh, which happened in Botanical Garden in Cologne, uh, where we also explored these issues together with some researchers. The second exhibition that uh, I, I think many of you saw is this uh, was Florafilia Plants, uh, Revolution of Plants. That was more directed towards the future, uh, where the idea was how what can we actually learn from plants and uh, uh and what kind of uh what what can they inspire how they can move us and in which direction uh they can guide us especially in uh, concerning political uh political involvement uh and as you see in both exhibitions uh, me and mateusz okoński were working quite a lot with exhibition design this is something that is very important for us and uh, uh but i will i will not talk about details here because it would be a separate talk uh, in this exhibition, for example, we also had a very nice artwork of Dagna Jakubowska on invasive plants and cooking, uh, and she's cooking uh, very tasteful dishes from invasive plants, and at the opening we could, we could try and get their uh, special powers through the act of eating them. So there were some uh, rituals uh, involved. Uh, so these exhibitions uh, definitely... Uh, we can of course say that they are, you know, they originate because of the climate change, but I also think there was a kind of a certain animal stage in the artwork. Now there are plants, so I wonder what would be the next, you know, I bet on insects, the level of uh, strangeness is kind of arising, I think. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I would love to co 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 curate exhibition on insects, well, let's see. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, they were quite uh, uh, they were quite interested and what we also can observe there, there is this kind of a heightened interest that was very visible in florophilia revolution of plants in in rituals in uh, indigenous knowledges uh, 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 and uh, and all this this kind of uh, other world views where our relation to nature is uh, very much different from well western uh, modern thinking i would say uh, by the way, there is also a very interesting exhibition now in Aachen of Frankfurter Hauptschule uh, and at the Neuer Aachen Kunstverein. And this exhibition is really uh, exploring this a bit, but also um, some kind of a negative uh, aspects of it, uh, uh, like uh, closeness of some esoteric movements to anti-vaccination movements and conspiracy theories. Uh, I really recommend this exhibition. There is one element there, I think, that would that will be perplexing for many of us. There is like a magical sphere in one of the installations. And on this sphere, you have a text and you have a face of Rudolf Steiner. And this face is changing into the face of Donna Haraway. And it's obviously a uh, provocation, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I find it quite interesting. And of course, what I will be talking about today is far away of this kind of, um, uh, of the trends that the that Frankfurt and Hauptschule is trying to uh, uh, show in their exhibition, but uh, uh, but there is this aesthetics and it's interesting where does it come from and uh, what are the reasons for that, of course, and it can be appropriated by the right, but also by the left, uh, or yeah. So this is so so this so this is this status quo and. Uh, uh, what I also observe is in most of the institutions, at least from what I, I see, but of course I'm, I don't know it for sure, but uh, I think it is uh, certainly the case. Um, uh, uh, the whole uh, potentially emancipatory content uh, uh, of, of this show is kind of a contained in the exhibition itself. The exhibitions sometimes are quite political. They, they, have a, they present certain progressive ideas. Uh, um, and um, and uh, uh, and other uh, approaches to art, uh, 
uh, but uh, they also um, the the ecological thinking there it's uh, if it kind of uh, seeps into the institutional work it's mostly mostly uh, reduced to thinking about you know using ecological paper not using too much energy which of course is also super important but uh, but I think there is much more there that we can uh, actually uh, use. Um, uh, uh, what I observe, uh, unfortunately, quite often in art institutions that uh, very often we have this kind of a very progressive content in the program, but if we look a bit at the uh, at what's going on behind the scenes, then it could be much more progressive. Yeah, but very, very often it's actually quite conservative, very, very hierarchical, and you know I will talk more about it later. Uh, so somehow there is this kind of, uh, maybe I would not use the word hy hypocrisy, but kind of almost that the content doesn't match uh, the structure. Uh, 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 and, and this is a bit, uh, this is a bit of a, a problem, uh, I think. Um, when I actually was thinking about all this exhibition, I reminded myself uh, a very interesting statement of Boris Groys, uh, a philosopher and art critic, I'm sure you know him. Uh, and he says that uh, what museums do is they institution, uh, institutionalize revolutionary ideas as a kind of a irre irredeemably dead past. Uh, that by displaying the uh, material objects, the revolution becomes a corpse. Uh, and, and each exhibit, exhibit is serving as an evidence of the impossibility of res resurgence. Uh, I find it quite an interesting uh, statement i also wanted to uh, show you uh, uh, to present you a little quote from what he's writing uh, it's a it's a very good text on art activism that it's possible to find on eflux uh, however the museum in the daylight is a place of definite death that allows no resurrection no return of the past the museum institutionalizes the truly radical atheistic revolutionary violence that demonstrates that past, the past is incurably dead. It is a purely materialistic death without return. The aestheticized material corpse functioned as a testimony to the impossibility of resurrection. resurrection. And now there is a very fu uh, funny example concerning um, Lenin. Uh, actually, this is why Stalin insisted so much on permanently exhibiting the dead Lenin's body to the public. Lenin's mausoleum is a visible guarantee that Lenin and Leninism are truly dead. That is also why the current leaders of Russia do not hurry to bury Lenin, contrary to the appeals made by many Russians to do so. They do not want the return of Leninism, which would become possible if Lenin were buried. I find it uh, quite uh, 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 revealing this quote, and I wonder um, uh, what what happens when when museums uh, start to show all this very uh, all these artworks about plants and referring to ecology? Does it mean that it's kind of uh, already dead this potentially revolutionary source, or what actually happens? Or maybe it becomes dead through the uh, through the act of musealization? Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I am full, fully aware that this um, claim of Groys may, might be a bit controversial. We can discuss it uh, later, but. I find it quite uh, inspiring. So I would, um, uh, so I would uh, maybe suggest that uh, uh, that uh, okay, we can do the, all these beautiful exhibitions, but we still should keep these ideas alive, yeah. And we should not just muse musealize them and show in our uh, beautiful uh, uh, white cubes uh, 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 or maybe broken white cubes or beige white cubes, like uh, I'm sometimes trying to do. Uh, uh, so, so I would. Uh, so my um, talk, talk is also about that: how to keep these ideas, this interesting ecological, um, uh, ecological thoughts, how to keep them uh, alive um, uh, in in art, and how to uh, allow them to have play a role in our art institutions and in the art system, and not just to show them as um, objects, uh, as uh, uh, as uh, as dead bodies in the exhibition space, as Gros uh, says, says uh, corpses. Um, and uh, so, so that's one, uh, one kind of a starting point. Another one is that uh, I, I meet, I don't know how it is with you, but I meet a lot of people that are very unhappy with the art system. And I'm also, 
uh, uh, unhappy with that. And there is a lot of nagging and a lot of, um, uh, and the more, the, lo the longer people remain in the system, the more they kind of uh, fantasize about getting out of it, you know, and developing some other hobbies or, or doing something else uh, or becoming activists or, uh, or uh, um, coaching, uh, coaching advisors and so on. So, so I wonder, uh, I wonder if you also uh, share this, you can write in the chat if, if you do, but there is a bit, uh, a bit of a disappointment, yeah. Of course, I, I would say I have a quite I have a bit moderate view on that, <laughs> because I also see a lot of uh, amazing people in institutions, in in governments, uh, artists, uh, activists that are in uh, that are try, art school teachers that are trying to uh, to uh, 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 actively deal with with the problems of the art system and uh, design some ways of uh, overcoming them, but but still there is a kind of a uh yeah there is the kind of a skepticism towards it yeah and and i think many of us have a feeling that it really should be different yeah and what usually my colleagues uh, tell me about is that they uh see that it's very hard for people to work collectively that uh, uh that there is a very strong individualization and feeling of competition lack of solidarity and not so many uh actors in, in the art system are involved in a, any kind of a solidarity networks. Uh, there is a proliferation of burnouts. Uh, Temporary Gallery organized a workshop on curatorial fees this year, and it was run by two freelance curators, and both of them had burnouts. And it was very important experience in their lives that really changed some ways of working and, uh, and, um, and some of the beliefs they had. Um, uh, and for the burnouts, institutions don't feel responsible for that. And sometimes even work colleagues don't say that they actually are close to burnout. Maybe they are not used to sharing their fragility or maybe the atmosphere at institutions is, is, is not welcoming this. It's, it's a super complex issues. Uh, we also see a lot of, for example, what my colleagues don't like is a short term uh, funding structures. Um, uh, uh, lack or, or uh, of structural funding or diminishing of structural funding and turning it into project funding. Um, we see a lot of uh, what I would call politics of big events or festivalization of culture. There is a lot of uh, festival, but not enough support for ongoing initiatives in the cities. Uh, uh, and also there, there, there is a problem with recognition, and this is of course not only in the art system, you see that it's all not only about art system, I think it's quite clear. <laughs> um, for example, there is not enough uh, recognition for long term work and also work that doesn't bring immediate visible results, yeah? a work that kind of happens behind the scenes um, uh, that is not uh, super visible. Like I'm trying to establish in Cologne a program for a residency program for curators, and it's super hard to find funding for something like that because it is a very invisible program. People come, they meet artists, they maybe conduct one workshop, uh, but it's a very slow work, uh, and uh, and it uh, will bring results hopefully. In, for example, curators inviting artists to exhibitions and so on, or a kind of a mutual inspiration. Uh, rather on, no, only in the long run, yeah. So there, so there is more and more problem with that. Um, also, we see a lot of depoliticization. So uh, I also, also mentioned that lack of involvement in uh, artist organizations or workers unions. The problems with diversity, I think I don't have to uh, uh, talk a lot about that, that, uh, uh, that it seems that um, the art field is very homogeneous concerning the identity and class and so on. Um, exploitation, my favorite examples are, um, my favorite example are residency programs that are in fact badly paid jobs where you have so much to do that it's not a residency, it's just a job, but because it's called residency then you can pay less. And a lot of bureaucracy, uh, a lot of bureaucracy uh, uh, and a lot of is required from the users of the system, but um, the big players in the system, they uh, sometimes um, don't see that they should also give something in return. For example, if someone asks for feedback, why I didn't get the grant, this feedback should be given because it was a lot of work to prepare application for a grant. And I know that it's a problem because there are maybe many people that want to get a feedback, but we have to deal with that. Yeah. 
So there is a lot uh, what I also really like to talk about are very strong hierarchical structures in art institutions, although there are many uh, contemporary management theories that uh, actually uh, say that uh, different, uh, uh, different types of structure would be much better. Like for example, amazing, uh, very interesting book by Frederic Lalo, Reinventing Organizations. Uh, and so on and so on. I don't, I don't want to maybe I could talk I have much more in my in my notes about it, but I, I think I will I will leave it at that. I think we you all understand me. Uh, and then there is something that I would call uh, NAR. And NAR, it's uh, something that I will um, no liberal art realism. No liberal. And what it is? It is not an aesthetic uh, move, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't refer to aesthetics. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, I came about, uh, I came with while thinking about uh, this lecture. And uh, the obvious inspiration is the capitalist realism by Mark Fisher uh, that I, I think many of you know. And this capital realism is basically uh, uh, this kind of a conviction that capitalism is the only viable political and economic system, and it's impossible to imagine any alternatives. So neoliberal art realism would be something like uh, capitalist realism, but uh, applied to art system. So it would mean that, uh, uh, that the art world as it is, the status quo of the art world is the only viable art system, and it's imp impossible to imagine any kind of a good and coherent alternative to it. And this is also, I think, quite widespread. Uh, and it's very, um, and I think it also kind of immobilizes some efforts of changing things because we tend to think that the art system is given, like capitalism is eternal. Uh, uh, and, and basically that's it. We are, it's the end of history for the art system, you know? Now, there will be no development. Um, uh, and I would, uh, 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 and what I think we really need to do in order to really, um, in order to uh, counter this uh, state of mind is we really have to become aware of the historicity of the art system, that it, it is a particular period of time that generated this system, yeah? And it is not eternal. And what I really, uh, um, Sorry, I'm talking really all the time. I have to stop. <laughs> um, what I, what I particularly, um, what I, what I found particularly inspiring in the last uh, months was a very interesting conversation uh, between um, three people: uh, Lara Khaldi, Yazan Khalili, and Marva Arsanios. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will, I will put a link to this conversation in our chat window. Uh, it's a it's a conversation that it doesn't refer to our topic, I would say uh, directly, but there is a lot of interesting food for thought, I think, in this conversation, because they they talk about how uh, mostly they talk about Palestine because Lara Khardi and Yazan Khalili they uh, uh, are involved in the workings of one art center in Ramallah. Uh, and they talk about how uh, the art world in Palestine changed with the introduction of uh, NGOs and a kind of a neoliberal uh, trend uh, that came to Palestine. And they, they are talking, for example, about cultural centers that were very politicized, and then they kind of turned into art institutions. Uh, and this was, uh, and the funding was given on the basis that the that the art institution will be neutral, that they, they would ne neutralize potential political claims and they become this neutral white cube spaces as in the West, yeah? Um, and what is really uh, a good, I think, effect of, re of reading this conversation is that we kind of really understand, okay, it's not eternal. <laughs> it appeared at certain point and it maybe, it might also disappear or at least change, uh, a change to some considerable extent. I also remember very well when I was at the Upper Art Center, we were um, studying the correspondence between the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam and um, situationists, uh, Guy Debord, and we were reading their letters and I was quite uh, uh, shocked, you know, that they wrote to the director, I think in January, 
uh, and then the director responded in February. Uh, and you know, there, there was definitely correspondence, and I think all the you know art uh, uh, art exhibition making looked like that. But but it was totally different than what we have now, where it's like bo being bo constantly bombed with emails, and and it was supposed to make our work easier, but actually it accelerates everything. Uh, and uh, and forces us actually to do more, I think. So uh, so th so I really recommend to read this uh, conversation. And uh, what I also observe is that some of my friends uh, started not to call themselves curators, but they call themselves cultural workers. And I was always defending the word curator, but now I think maybe curator belongs to this neoliberal art realism uh, state of mind you know it's this uh, individual this star that is uh, uh, so mobile and traveling and it's all about individual authorship maybe this is a way you know uh, maybe the the language the use of language uh, is also shows us that we are kind of a, we want to exit that so i i know i'm a little bit uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm hesitant. I don't know if I should say curator or cultural worker, but I, I actually like cultural worker more and more. So let's see. You can write in the chat what, what do you prefer <laughs> if you want. Um, okay, so so the question is if, if, if how to get out of this uh, NAR, you know, if you re read it backwards, it's run, you know, so to run, run away from it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what I what I think to really like exit that it's uh, of course super hard. Uh, and the question is similar to the question how to exit capitalism. Yeah, so there is a certain utopian uh, aspect to it. But I think to to exit that like my my te my thesis in this lecture would be that we need something very strong. That we need some kind of a totally different frame of mind. That kind of a will be really providing a very strong counter perspective to what this uh, neoliberal art system has to um, is offering us. And we, we need something also that will not only uh, appeal to us on the level of theory, on the level of thought, but we need something that really involves us as people. We need something that, um, uh, um, that engages also our bodies, that, has, that produces some rituals. Uh, uh, and uh, that's something that will sustain uh, an impulse for change. Um, so you, you see that I'm a very utopian person. I think it's quite clear now. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really crucial. And maybe I think about utopia is not something that we project in future, but about different ideas for changes that we can all already practice now. Uh, that's what I learned from Professor Lore, who I see is also here, right? <laughs> uh, uh, in her seminar at KHM. <laughs> so this, this high. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so all these uh, attempts uh, kind of have to, um, uh, uh, have to be tried out immediately and without having like a real big co coherent vision. And uh, uh, and what I I'm thinking about a lot recently is that maybe in this whole ecological change that we are seeing, maybe this is a, a good. Uh, I, I would be really curious to see what you think. You know, maybe I'm naive. I don't know, but I have a feeling that this all this ecological um, state of mind that is coming uh, is really uh, uh, can be something like that. Uh, uh, and sometimes I make a joke that, you know, the only, we need something like a new religion. And then I say that, you know, permaculture that I always spoke about later is like a new religion. <laughs> that we need something that is, has a theory, uh, has rituals and, and is political in the, in the sense that we want it to be political uh, and is able to uh, uh, bring people into a kind of a, a community. And also I have a feeling that, you know, there will be many attempts now to go uh, to kind of a transition to a different kind of economy. Of course, uh, the, uh, we can be more optimistic about it, more pessimistic. You know, I, uh, I prefer to be more optimistic and see what I can do. Yeah, but uh, uh, the situation is very complex, but there will be many attempts and we are seeing that to transform this, to transform the system. And of course we, we can also say that all these attempts will be again become part of the system, but um, I really think we we uh, should uh, try. 
uh, and and maybe this is also a way for um, for the art institutions uh, to change that that we can kind of do it parallel with the whole society that has to transform so we can use this whole ecological challenge that is poised to us through climate change also to transform art institutions and not only to bring them in this kind of uh, ecological procedures as i said ecological paper and so on but to really try to fight against this neoliberal system of arts together with other institutions of course um and where, where i kind of uh, from from what i i take hope uh, uh, here like what what is uh, what kind of a supports me in thinking that this is possible uh, first of all i i think a lot about uh, some artworks uh, that uh, uh, i was exhibiting in the past uh, uh, or wanted to exhibit uh, and i i kind of uh, think that that artists also uh, sense this change and very often they can they um create a place for it in their artworks uh, and I wanted to share with you this, uh, I already was showing a photo of a work of Milena Bonilla, I write her name maybe in the chat window. Now I will share uh, other photos of this work. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you uh, remember it from the from the from the Florafilia exhibition. Uh, the title of this work is a "Spring Starts as a Murmur," a Utopia in the brackets, and it's from 2019. Uh, and this is a work that is uh, that revolves around uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Polish Marxist theorist. And I, I, don't, I think I don't have to introduce her. Uh, and we know that Rosa Luxemburg had a passion for botany and she had her own herbarium. There were actually more artworks uh, uh, inspired by, by her passion for botany, but I think the, the work of Bonilla is, uh, really stands out. Uh, and, um, uh, and what Milena basically did, she examined the plants that uh, Luxemburg collected in her herbarium during the years of imprisonment uh, and later and before. Uh, and uh, she provided kind of, a, and Milena provided a kind of a more political uh, interpretation of these uh, plants. So this is how this looked at temporary, how, how we were presenting it at temporary gallery. And as you see, there are different connections with, with the, between different types of plants. And, and sometimes they are gathered in clusters, like here, cluster of indifference. Uh, yeah. There is very, so uh, I, I, I will show you now the online, the kind of a virtual digital version of this artwork that uh, Milena uh, prepared with uh, bigger images of this, of these plants. Uh, and uh, but uh, when I'm showing now this this whole table, what I'm thinking about is that it is like a, some kind of a thinking model. That it looks like some kind of a diagram or diagrammatic structure or uh, a kind of a mind map. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the the ways the the directions of thoughts are defined by the potential of these seeds. Um, I can show you some examples of the of the plants that she has uh, in this uh, in this uh, work. So this is Ag uh, Agrimonia eupatoria, asparagus, Borago officinalis. Uh, boxwood. So as you see, she, she kind of describes this kind of a polit potential political interpretation in a very uh, poetic way. And I, 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 I liked it. I, I like to bring these two things. I like that she brought these two things together. Yeah, botany and some kind of a political consciousness, because very often, of course, plants function in this totally depoliticized context. Yeah, they become decorations, they become commodities, of course, uh, uh, and they are uh, and, and this kind of uh, uh, intertwining with some political thoughts is not uh, present. Yeah? Okay, I have many more. Uh, 
Centaurium Eritrea. Clematis. Uh, yeah, I think I cannot show uh, all of them, but if you will be, uh, uh, if you will be uh, 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 following this link to the Florafilia exhibition, there is a link to the online version of it, and the work of Bonilla is there, so you can you can check also the other other seats. Um, uh, so I, I I sometimes tend to think that maybe you know if you really uh, are close to plants, if you really observe them on a daily basis, if you dedicate some attention to them, maybe you can arrive at, at these thoughts, you know, that maybe they will kind of shape the way you think and, and the way you speak. The very interesting, uh, uh, my second uh, example uh, is um, uh, refers not to artists, uh, but uh, another group of people that could be uh, that could potentially guide us and these are scientists that work on the topic of plants uh, for me uh, particularly uh, important experience was when i spoke to ursula zajączkowska uh, who is uh, okay now i can stop this sharing uh, ursula zajączkowska is a botanist but she is also a poet a very good poet and, um, uh, and Ursula is uh, doing research on mosses on different types of plants. Uh, she works at, uh, in Warsaw at the, um, I think, uni university or department for far forest biology. Uh, and uh, through uh, like talking to her, I noticed that she speaks differently even. You know? She talks differently about plants. Uh, for example, in this exhibition, Florafilia Plants as Archives, we had a an artwork which, uh, for which the artist transported a part of a meadow from Poland. And I was telling Ursula, I know, and we had this meadow and the ants from this meadow, they started to spread in the art space. And, you know, they kind of uh, went towards other artworks in the exhibition. And, Ur and Ursula looked at me and they said, yes, they were looking for a new habitat. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, maybe this act of, of ripping this meadow apart was maybe actually not so good, you know. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe the this artwork could could have been um, done differently. Yeah? Ursula also wrote a, a, a very interesting text, but I think it's unfortunately only in Polish, which is about how contemporary artists uh, torture plants in their art installations and uh, uh, art objects. Uh, uh, maybe she was unjust towards some Polish artists in this text, <laughs> but but she was also you know clearly seeing a problem in how plants are treated, uh, and I have a feeling that uh, through her poetry, but also through her scientific work, Ursula really is getting at another level, I would say, of human development. Yeah, and it is a very different uh, state of mind. I think that she has because she has this closeness to this other uh, types, type of being. And, uh, and she, she even speaks differently. And through her poetry, she also kind of uh, explores, um, explores different ways of, of speaking about the experiences that she has. And I can share here, uh, I wanted to share a poem of, of Ursula very quickly. Mm. This specifically uh, the poem relates to the topic of revolution. So I think it's good. Ah, full name Ursula, of course, the you disappeared. And uh, the link is to a folder with more poems of Ursula. It was the exhibition folder for the Florafilia, Florafilia uh, show. Um, Another person that comes also to my mind when I think about scientists that kind of uh, uh, transitions to another level, I would say, is Robin Wall Kimmerer. I don't know if you know her. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, and Robin Wall, Wall Kimmerer, she's also a, a botanist, specializing actually in, uh, in mosses. And uh, she, uh, She's a professor at uh, 
the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, and she wrote a really amazing book with the title Gathering Moss, which I also have here, Gathering Moss. Uh, in which she kind of uh, combines the reflection on mosses and plants with her individual history. She also has um, uh, partly uh, indigenous roots, so she also combines it with, with uh, her heritage. Uh, and it's this really amazing book, and I never, I think, read a book like that, you know? It's, it's like a very interesting mix of the scientific, the personal, uh, uh, and 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 this kind of a reference to other worldviews is also super present there, but it's all kind of uh, uh, supported by really like her scientific work. Yeah, she's describing how she conducted some experiments, uh, uh, and this is also like uh, I think really uh, uh, interesting path, you know, and interesting uh, 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 way to kind of. Uh, go in this direction to, to meet people that spend a lot of time with plants. That's how I would uh, uh, summarize this. Also in another artwork in Florafilia exhibition, um, we're showing this film of uh, Osa Sonia's daughter cultivating abundance. And, uh, and here uh, she, in, the, in the movie, she's, um, uh, uh, she's uh, showing this uh, Swedish plant breeder and agronomist uh, Hans Larsson. Asa Sonia's daughter, that's her name. And he is um, really working towards uh, uh, more diverse, uh, diverse diversification of, of plants and uh, works with, is create, created a seed bank. And at some point in this movie, he says that he communicates with plants. There is this kind of a mystical, magical sentence via observation of, of their external features, how they look like. And then uh, on the basis of that, he selects uh, uh, plants that he, he breeds further. Uh, uh, so I, I also found that very uh, compelling moment in that, in that movie that uh, 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 he's kind of uh, changing the language, I would say. Um, uh, and, um, and what is uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, visible in, this, um, in the work of these people is that uh, they seem to confirm some of the worldviews that are actually very ancient. And Robert, Robin Wall, uh, Kimmerer uh, writes uh, uh, very nicely uh, about that, that, uh, wait a moment, I have to find it. Uh, that traditional knowledge arises from careful systematic observation of nature from the results of innumerable lift experiments. So she's kind of uh, uh, also bringing the two together, that this contemporary science actually confirms what indigenous tribes were new from the very beginning, and they come together in a, interestingly. Uh, and here I wanted to show, you an, uh, to show to you another artwork from a Florafilia show, which is a work of Candice Lean. Um, title of this work is uh, Five Kingdom Kingdoms, and it's an etching, maybe now you see it better, presenting uh, uh, actually a contemporary uh, scientific theory uh, in which uh, uh, that advocates a classification of all beings on earth into five, uh, uh, five categories. Uh, but this uh, uh, quite modern theory that some biologists uh, don't support, some support, so there, is, there are discussions about it, is presented in a kind of a mystical alchemical language. Uh, <laughs> another artwork of Candice Lynn that we are presenting in this exhibition is uh, also using this kind of aesthetics, looks like, as, as a, like kind, some kind of a medieval tractatus, uh, bacteria plants, uh, mushrooms. Uh, so, so I have a feeling that Ka Candice, I, I never uh, spoke with her about that, but she kind of uh, felt it, that it's kind of uh, all coming together uh, uh, now. And, uh, uh, and it's a very, very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, situation, I think. Um, 
yeah so this so this this was my second point like the scientists that are kind of uh, transitioning towards another state of mind uh, another uh, potential uh, source of inspiration that could kind of uh, help us to fight the the uh, how was it called no liberal art realism <laughs> i would say uh, uh, is permaculture uh, permaculture originated in the 70s, but actually it draws a lot from indigenous knowledges, for example, Aboriginal knowledges that this kind of uh, was also acknowledged. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I will, I cannot now provide like a full lecture on, on permaculture, <laughs> but I can show you one, one drawing that uh, shows the basic uh, principles uh, of it. And I can share a link where you can read more on it. Uh, so it is a it is a specific type of design philosophy, uh, and the main question that is that it is dealing with is how to create a sustainable, resilient, and productive human uh, cultures. Uh, and uh, what I really like about permaculture is that it's quite political. Uh, it is not just about uh, gar gardening. It has a quite uh, uh, it has a quite important political component, and it really uh, became obvious uh, for me when um, Temporary Gallery last year organized a course in permaculture, an online course. We had um, I think around ninety participants in our course, and we did it with a professional permacultural uh, teacher, uh, and and. Uh, and this teacher had a very activist background and he also told, told us uh, a lot uh, uh, about it. Uh, so uh, uh, somehow uh, 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 the transition for him was, was possible, yeah? Uh, and as you see, there are these um, 12 design principles in permaculture. And for example, what I'm trying to do now and I hope to continue is in future is how to apply this principle to our principles in, to art institution. And how, uh, uh, as you see, some of them are, can be interpreted quite politically, like use and value diversity, or use edges and value the mar marginal. The marginal. Um, and I think uh, what I, what I, uh, and I see a lot of potential with that because it kind of shows a, a kind of a quite, uh, it allows you to do a very complex analysis of, of your environment and what you are actually uh, doing. And this path uh, I will be fo following uh, uh, in the summer with Nadar Schroer and Julia Harman, who are also here, uh, because we are working together on an international seminar uh, that will be uh, very much revolving around these topics, how to uh, kind of uh, use this uh, ecological uh, ways of thinking for the politicized ecological thinking for transforming art institutions and how how this can be, uh, uh, how they can help us uh, to uh, uh, run from uh, no liberal art realism. Yes, that's how is it called. Well, what I also really like about permaculture is that it's very uh, kind of uh, uh, promiscuous. It kind of uh, really draws from various sources uh and it's very um syncretic uh so it, it it really draws a lot from science and it combines it with uh uh, uh more spiritual and political uh, aspects um and i i sometimes make this joke that if, if anything replaces religion then it will be permaculture because it uh, re religion also needs its rituals and permaculture has a lot of rituals to offer that are related to taking care of the soil, for example, and uh, taking care of the community that takes care of the soil and so on and so on. So there, there, so there is quite a lot uh, that you can do actually if you apply it. And also a very important part of permaculture is how to grow more in the cities and how, how we can do this. And there, there are even the Guardian, the Guardian recently wrote, wrote about it that actually we can really grow a lot in the cities. Uh, and there is a big potential in that, and this and this could, but for that, of course, we need more more communities, and we need more we need we need more solutions. But this is actually very possible, very much possible. What we also did as temporary gallery, a part of the course, we 
we started a, a small group at the community garden in Cologne, uh, Neuland Köln. Uh, and this group uh, uh, was meeting last year. Uh, and we, some of them also participated in the permaculture course. Uh, and our goal is to continue it next year. Um, uh, Nada uh, uh, came up with some really uh, exciting ideas for that and we got funding. So we will be continuing to work there. And uh, our meetings were not public last year, but now I think will be more, it will be possible to do more public events. But yeah, we also have to uh, speak to the garden, of course, about it. We are we kind of just got information that we got the funding for that, so we can really continue with that. And this, what is also interesting, this this community garden is placed next to a place with where uh, re refugees live in containers. So it's a it's kind of a perplexing situation when you go there because you have this community garden, which is a bit like a paradise of the mid middle class, yeah, but middle class shrinking so anyway it's it's like a little paradise and then you have on the other uh, side of the road you have the containers and you have people living uh, and i know that the gardens sometimes try to interact more uh, and and let's see you know I, I i have this little hope that if we have a nice group of people in the garden maybe we will be able to reach out and uh, i don't know maybe just invite people for coffee and cake for the beginning you know I know that sometimes females from the that live there they learn biking in the garden. There is a ferry in the garden that kind of offers this, and they bike through the garden. So that's already great, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but so so I I I I, uh, I see a lot of hope in permaculture because uh, it is, as I said, political, spiritual, and it is very very practical. Um, Yes, and then uh, I would like to come to the last part of my talk. I think I have 10 minutes, that's fine. Uh, and this is a, a kind of a thought uh, experiment, maybe not only a thought experiment that I uh, uh, pursue since a while. And this is, uh, it's based on selecting a particular plant and thinking how actually this plant can uh, inspire me, uh, influence my thoughts. I know that it uh, sounds mystical, yeah? It sounds weird, yeah? That's the first, I guess, reaction. It was also, I think, my reaction when I read, uh, was reading a text of Robin Hall Kimmerer, for example. Uh, but uh, I have a feeling that, um, yeah, we, we can encounter basically our environment in, in different ways, that we can go deeper into the, deeper in the encounter, for example, with a particular plant, yeah? And it will be poetic and it will not be super rational probably and maybe some uh, someone could laugh uh, us hearing what we think about this plant and so on but i think maybe it doesn't matter what the what the what the others think but but the need to pursue this is important and maybe we should kind of uh, venture into that so uh, i don't know uh, entirely why but i have this fascination with these very small plants mosses and lichens that's why Temporary Gallery had a symposium on mosses and lichens. Um, I think in 2020, there, there are some lectures available online on our uh, YouTube channel still. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I kind of uh, developed some kind of affinity for these plants. Uh, and, uh, and there are more, uh, it seems there are more people that really like these small plants. Uh, so we, for example, had Michael Marder, who is a super interesting philosopher that extensively writes on plants and I think in a very bold way uh, uh, and uh, very fresh and uh, very invigorating way, I would say. Uh, but we also had Ursula Zajączkowska who was telling uh, us about her research on mosses. And we also had um, uh, Lori Palmer who is writing a book on lichens. So we had these three uh, free lectures. And now I wanted to uh, what I wanted to share with you are some photos, you know, to kind of uh, go deeper into this topic. <laughs> some photos of the mosses that I uh, did in Bergen, uh, where I went for a Bergen assembly, just to kind of, uh, especially this moss forest, that is really amazing. And I would like now to share uh, a quote from another book that is actually a novel 
by a very popular author. It will be a bit longer quote, but I think it's okay. Oh, somehow I cannot, I don't know why I cannot paste it now. But it worked before. Into the chat or how? Yeah, yeah, I want to paste it in the mm -hmm. chat. If it will not work out, I will, I will show it on the Maybe it's too long. Yeah, I think it's too long. Okay, let's start. So this is this is a book of of uh, of uh, author called Elizabeth uh, Gilbert or Gilbert, and she wrote this extremely popular book, Eat, Pray, Laugh. Maybe you saw a movie. Uh, I think it's not the most uh, exciting, uh, or you know, it's a very popular. Uh, literature of course uh, but she also wrote another book which is really great <laughs> um, the title of this book is the signature all, uh, of all things and i have a, a theory that this book was inspired by the book of robin wall kimmerer on moses i'm not entirely sure but i have a feeling that that was the that was the primary uh, inspiration and it is a book about, uh, it's a book with a certain feminist uh, angle because it is about a scientist. I think in 17, she's act active, I think in the 17th century or 18th century, a female scientist who is studying Moses. <laughs> uh, and uh, let me share with you uh, uh, some fragments of it. In every way, Moses could seem plain, dull, modest, even primitive. The simple weeds sprouting from the humble city sidewalk appeared infinitely more sophisticated by comparison. But here is what few people understood. Moss is inconceivably strong. Moss eats stone, scarcely anything in return eats moss. Moss dines upon boulders, slowly but devastatingly, in a meal that lasts for centuries. Given enough time, a colony of moss can turn a cliff into gravel and turn that gravel into topsoil. Under shelves of exposed uh, limestone, most colonies create dripping living sponges that hold on tight and drink calciferous water straight from the stone. Over time, the mix of moss and mineral will itself turn into travertine marble. Within that hard, creamy white marble surface, one will forever see veins of blue, green, and gray, the trace of the anti-diluvian moss settlements. St. Peter's Basilica itself was built from the staff, both created by and stained with the bodies of ancient moss colonies. Moss grows where nothing else can grow. It grows on bricks, it grows on tree bark, on roofing slate, it grows in the Arctic Circle uh, and in the Balmiest Tropics. It also grows on the fur of sloths, on the back of snails and on decaying human bones. Moons is the first sign of botanic life to reappear on land that has been burned or otherwise stripped down to burners. Moss has the temerity to be begin luring the forest back to life. It is a resurrection engine. A single clump, clump of mosses can lie dormant and dry for 40 years at a stretch and then vault back again into life with a mere soaking of water. Somewhere between geological time and human time, there was something else, most time. By comparison to geological time, most time was blindingly fast for Moses could make progress in a thousand years that a stone could not dream of accomplishing in a million. But relative to human time, most time was agingly slow. To the unschooled human eye, most didn't even seem to move at all, but most did move and with extraordinary results. Nothing seemed to happen, but then a decade or so later, all would be changed. It was merely that moss moved so slowly that most of humanity could not track it. Uh, 
Uh, and what, what I'm in, in my thought experiment that I, I would be really curious what you think about this because I'm a little bit afraid actually of sharing that because it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, it's, it's something new for me. So I, I would be very, very interested if you think there is some potential in that type of thinking that we kind of uh, treat and encounter with a particular being, being very, very seriously. And then we try to kind of uh, draw some inspiration for that for our own uh, practice, yeah. Uh, so what I what I really like about uh, about these little plants, it's of course that they are small, like temporary gallery is a very small art institution. Uh, they are uh, competing for the sun with trees is not possible, as the trees will always uh, win. So the life of these mosses is limited to shade. They flourish in shade. Uh, so I sometimes think that it's a very modest type of a plant. And that maybe, you know, there are these big art institutions and they get all this glamour and maybe we as temporary gallery are in shade, but it's okay. We can still kind of flourish there and maybe we don't, we don't need that and we will not, will not get a heat in illness and remain modest. <laughs> so I kind of uh, start to think about this little plant as a way of, for myself to celebrate the smallness of my institution. Maybe we are a bit too small for all the things that, that we want to do. <laughs> and kind of uh, enjoy some kind of a uh, modesty that comes with that. Um, what I also really uh, 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 like about, about this uh, plant is that it grows very, very slowly. And there is in the quote, you have a lot about this moss time. And I think about art institution as something that also grows very, very slowly. And, is, is, and it may be a lot of what this institution does is very unspectacular. Maybe it's all also based on supporting artists and supporting the community. Uh, and then I also think about mosses, how they actually support the life in the forest uh, and how they uh, actually produce, um, uh, produce a, a safe site for germination and, and stabilizing the surface because they are actually effectively building up soil. Like the moss uh, traps different like wind blow soil and leaf fragments. Uh, uh, dead bugs, spores, and, and then they kind of uh, collect at the base of the moss and they gradually bring up the soil. Uh, so I also some, sometimes think about all this kind of a uh, barely visible work of, of different small art institutions. Uh, I'm not saying that the big ones are not doing that, but I think maybe the, the, the way we can do it is different than the way the big ones uh, are doing. Um, uh, then I, uh, 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 in the in the book of Rabin Wall there are great fragments on uh, reproduction, and I didn't know that. I don't know if you know that that mosses can actually change their gender. Uh, so not only some species of fish can change their gender, but mosses too, especially one called called Tetraphis is capable of that. So I think about this kind of a fluid. Uh, identity and not being, uh, you know, bound to to one uh, to one specific identity, maybe. Um, uh, and also, what is very important about the about mosses is the locality. You cannot move uh, moss and expect that it will thrive. Uh, and in the book of Kimmel, there is a very interesting uh, story of her uh, trying to be a. Uh, rather unsuccessfully a consultant for a very rich uh, person that she never met that is trying to kind of establish a moss garden and and at the end she discovers that actually this person is literally reaping mosses from the forest and bringing to our garden which of course she cannot uh, support so this uh, specific uh, type of a, of a plant is really tied to its environment and really responds uh, to the changes in environment and that's how I also really like to think about the art institution, and uh, 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 and I hope that the program of uh, my institution will become will become more and more locally relevant. Uh, of course, we don't want to uh, uh, resign from inviting international artists, but I but I think that this this kind of um, category of work is super important, uh, and it also requires a certain slowness. And maybe it will be not so. It will not be as glamorous as, as you know, inviting very uh, famous artists. Uh, uh, but it's a very important, uh, very important work that that uh, also has to uh, uh, has to be done. Uh, then what what I also found out about the mosses is they they support uh, actually symbiotic relations because. Uh, 
uh, apparently uh, uh, a tree, um, uh, uh, this carpet of mosses, they, when they were examined, there were more, more symbiotical relations underneath between the mushrooms and the trees. This myco, my, mycorrhize, I think that's how is it called. So somehow the, the, the moss kind of uh, was providing a better, better situation for, for, uh, for symbiotic relations, for collaboration, cooperation. Uh, and this is also how I think about uh, art institution. Uh, so as you see, it's a little bit, you know, um, uh, it's really an uh, ex uh, experiment. Uh, uh, and, uh, but for me, uh, uh, I think it is, it is promising and uh, requires some kind of uh, attentiveness that maybe uh, we uh, actually very often don't have uh, in that, yeah. Uh, and I think from this, from this slowness, from this, uh, from this, um, from these other type of encounters, maybe we, we can kind of open ourselves up to other ways of practicing art and to other possible uh, art systems. But I also sometimes wonder about is that what I see uh, in uh, like our biennials is that there is a big interest in indigenous art. And we of course know that it's very problematic. Uh, but what I don't see is uh, like really taking it seriously because very often it was embedded in specific rituals uh, uh, and it really functioned in relation to a specific community. Uh, and, and this is only exhibited, but, but uh, to think about art that is also a way of connecting to your own community this, for example, very often is not is not the case, yeah. Uh, so, um, and then I then I uh, immediately remind myself about the the conversation uh, uh, between uh, be between you know, Lara Yazan and Marva that is published on Eflux, and I think about how they how they speak about this kind of uh, art um, no liberal art institution being kind of uh, detached from uh, many areas of daily life, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, and I tend to think that maybe you know now we are in a stage where we kind of want to get this back, yeah. And it will never be like in the past, but maybe uh, you know by means of a double negation we can arrive at some uh, other model of uh, of an art institution that is uh, uh, not just this white cube space, uh, uh, a space of presentation, but uh, one that is doing a lot of this invisible work, and 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 that this is something that is also respected in and supported. Um, yeah, so this, so this was my most, uh, uh, most experiment. Uh, and as a co conclusion, uh, the uh, definitely last thing I want to share, uh, I want to share with you a ritual uh, that I wrote during a workshop with uh, Jumana Emil Abud uh, at Temporary Gallery. Uh, and it's a, um, uh, and it's a, uh, ritual that refers to this object. It's a chestnut cupel. Uh, and it's a, um, an object that my mother actually found and also relates to my personal story with my mother always collecting them also in my childhood. Uh, so I, I wrote uh, as a part of the workshop, I wrote a, a chestnut cupel ritual for internal and external growth. And I will share it with you. And uh, you know, if you, if you perform the ritual, let me know. <laughs> Moment. <clears throat> now again, it's something that is too long. Okay, that's part one. One thing that I also didn't uh, think you can save it and also read it later, mm -hmm. it's fine. <laughs> Uh, but in, you have to have this object to perform or something similar. You have to find it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's just a dried chestnut. You have to, you know, you have to go okay. on a quest so to find it. 
Yeah. One thing I that I also I know some places. Mm. one thing that I forgot to speak about also is um, uh, concerning mosses. Something that Ursula uh, actually Zajączkowska was researching is uh, how they actually share water. And it is super interesting because they cannot really store water. She calls them plants without skin because they cannot, you know, be this water like really contain it. Uh, but she made very nice movies in which, which we, she shows like they grow very closely to one another. Like how the how a drop of water falls on this kind of uh, little field of moss and how it is being distributed between all uh, little plants. Mm -hmm. And I kind of found it really interesting as a maybe uh, you know uh, some kind of a visual symbol of, of collaboration and sharing that mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah maybe it can be also used in that context okay that's that's it okay. thank you hope it was not too long <laughs> no thank you so much for this uh, really exciting talk I, I made some notes and then i follow just i follow you <laughs> because uh, you really took us a, a big way uh, starting with this uh, critique of our art institutions i think many of us feel the same as you and i, I don't want to, to say it again but taking us down and then then i found first uh, this this sentence of okay it's not forever it's not for eternity <laughs> i felt hope <laughs> and finally when you talked about permaculture i thought uh, we should should have it as a basic seminar at the KHM. So there's, I think there are many, many questions and, and there are many uh, things that you gave us today, um, inspiration that we can go into deeper. And I would like now, now like to open to, to the questions and to the audience. And please feel free to, go to ask and, and comment and get into talk. <laughs> 